sermon text this morning will come from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Hear now the word of God. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his, to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to, can to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask now that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our heart, would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Rock, our Redeemer, and nearest kinsman. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For the season of Advent and Christmas, we are taking a short break from the book of Ezekiel, having come to the climax of the first half of the book last week, where we saw the beginning of the end, that God had come in the person of Nebuchadnezzar to begin to lay siege upon Jerusalem. So that was a good place in the book of Ezekiel to take a pause, and it is a good season of the church year to take a pause. For the next couple Sundays that I will be preaching, we'll be looking uh, at the season of Advent through the early portions of the book of Matthew. And one person that the church has traditionally uh, connected to with the season of Advent is the person of John the Baptist. Now when we think and when we read about John the Baptist, one thing that might strike us is the stark contrast between him and our modern day Christmas celebration. I have long wanted to make a Christmas card that has a normal kitschy Christmas scene on the front and inside it says, Merry Christmas, you brood of vipers. <laughs> I don't know if it would make the best selling list. But why is there a connection between John the Baptist and the season of Advent? Usually around Christmas we think of Mary and Joseph, we think of shepherds and wise men. Why has the church normally in the season of Advent leading up to Christmas and especially on the second Sunday of Advent, we read about John the Baptist. John's role was to be a messenger, a herald. He was to be the person that would go before and announce the coming of the king. John the Baptist came on the scene briefly before Jesus' ministry when they were both adult men. And when we turn over to the book of Luke, we also understand that John the Baptist, as an unborn child, announced that the coming of Jesus was significant. When his mother stood before the mother of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, John the Baptist began leaping and doing flips in the womb in order to greet his mother, uh, uh, Virgin Mary, and in order to speak about the special child that she was carrying. John the Baptist's life was a life that was devoted to preparing everyone, preparing the nation for the coming of Jesus. From his leaping in the womb to his preaching, to his baptismal ministry, to his baptizing of Jesus, to his death by beheading, all of his life was dedicated to pointing at the one that was to come, to pointing at the coming King, Jesus. And so in this time of Advent, when we think about not just preparing ourselves or home to celebrate Jesus' first Advent, his first coming that we celebrate at Christmas, 
but also when we think about preparing ourselves, our hearts, our mind, our children for Jesus' second coming, his is a voice that we also must listen to, hear, and pay attention to. And when we pay attention to his voice, when we think about John the Baptist, what does he tell us? Well, he tells us about a king who is coming and bringing his kingdom. He tells us about sin. He tells us about repentance. And perhaps most importantly, he tells us about receiving these things with humility. In our sermon today, we're first going to look at the man, John the Baptist, and then we will look at the emblems of John the Baptist, and then finally, we will look at the message of John the Baptist. So our first point is the man, John the Baptist. If you were to flip back in your Bibles only a few pages to the very, very end of our New Testament, what you would find is that our New Testament, the English Bibles, actually end with a promise of John the Baptist. We have heard in Ezekiel all the promises of judgment and of exile. When we return to the book of Ezekiel, what we're beginning to hear is that God, after the time of judgment had come, God is now going to begin to promise restoration and return. So the first half of Israel, God's going to take you into exile. The second half, God is going to allow you to return, and that did happen. That happened about 70 years after the exile. But what they found is when they returned to Jerusalem, when Nehemiah rebuilt the wall, when they rebuilt the temple, it had not been as great, it had not been as glorious as all the prophets told them it would be. It had not been as glorious as the prophets said and promised, even at the end of Ezekiel and the rest of the prophets. When we turn to the, to the last few prophets in the time of the Old Testament, we find that the people are still in deep sin. Now, it's very different sin than the sin of rank idolatry that has sent them into exile, but the very last few prophets aren't saying, hey guys, we've arrived, everything is great. They're still calling out the sin. They're saying that the temple is less glorious and there is no king in Israel. And so the very last word in the Old Testament in Micah 4 or 5 is this. I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. If we would turn back just another chapter to Malachi 3, we would hear, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And so the end of the Old Testament closes with the promise that not just the Messiah will come, the, the promised king will come, but that God says, I myself am coming. And before God himself comes, the first thing he's going to do is he's going to send Elijah to prepare the way. Now, if you're a little fuzzy, remember that Elijah was the prophet who fought against the false worship in, in Israel, the, the false idolaters of Baal. Elijah was the prophet that spoke against the evil things that the king and queen Ahab and Jezebel were doing. Also, in, at the end of Elijah's life, in 2 Kings 2, we read that Elijah and his successor, Elisha, traveled together to the Jordan River, they crossed over the Jordan River, and at that point, Elijah was taken into heaven, and his ministry was passed over to Elijah. And so Elijah was one of the few people in the Bible who never died. He was taken up into heaven. That happened at the Jordan River. His ministry was passed over to Elijah, and throughout the rest of the Old Testament, the people are looking for Elijah to come again. And so when we turn to the New Testament, all four of the Gospels begin with John the Baptist. At the very beginnings of each of the Gospels, we see his baptism, his preaching, his confrontation with the Jewish uh, uh, religious and political leaders. So what should maybe shock us as we read through the Gospels is that the story of Jesus begins with the story of John the Baptist. In fact, in the Gospel of Mark, this fact is most Start. For Mark begins his gospel this way. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As Isaiah says, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming. 
This is striking. Mark is saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then he began talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the story of Jesus begins with John the Baptist. And why is this? Why is he such a central truth? I think he's a guy that when we think about the major characters in the New Testament, he's easy to pass over. We should understand that John, what he is, is he is the last in the line of old covenant prophets. And we've been in our in Ezekiel for a while, and so we might have a better understanding of what this means, of what it looks like. But the basic message of every single prophet is this, that something is coming, therefore get yourselves ready. Something is coming, something is on the horizon, something is about to happen, so prepare. Whether it's judgment is coming, whether it's an enemy army is coming, or drought is coming, the day of the Lord is coming, the return of exile is coming, something is coming, get yourselves ready. And so we see that as a prophet, John the Baptist, what he is, is the last and greatest prophet. He is the royal herald. He is the one who goes before the king, announces that the king is coming, and tells the people to get ready, to get their houses in order, to get their lives in order, to get the, the nation in order, to receive the visit of this king. Right? So you can imagine what would happen if a king would come into town without any kind of warning. Right, he would be walking around and no one would probably even recognize him uh, in this day and age. The king would come without any announcement and the people would have no idea what is happening or who he is. Without a herald, without someone announcing his coming, the people are, uh, would be unprepared, caught off guard, and not even recognize the king's presence in their midst. And so this is how Matthew 3 describes him, that John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah, who said, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John comes telling the people, the king, the Lord is coming, get yourselves ready. And so now we'll consider all of the emblems of John the Baptist. I'm trying to keep things with an M sound, so emblems of John the Baptist. And we're told in verses 4 through 6 that he dressed in a very particular way, that he ate a very particular food, that he performed a very particular act, and that he did so in a very particular location. As we have seen in Ezekiel, that what he ate, how he acted, even sometimes what he wore, all had very important symbolic significance. And so it is with John the Baptist. I think sometimes it's easy for us to read this and think, well, the Bible's just telling us that he's a really strange guy. But I think with, like all the prophets, all of these things are filled with symbolic meaning. And so first, consider his dress. Matthew tells us that he wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt was around his waist. And so why are we told that he has a camel hair cloak? Well, we have hints in the Old Testament that a, a hairy cloak was a sort of uniform for God's prophets. We see this in Zechariah 13. Zechariah is talking about false prophets. He's saying the false prophets are going to come to an end. They will give no more false prophecies. And he says this. He says, they will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive, but instead they will say, I am no prophet. And so what Zechariah is responding to is false prophets who in order to make themselves look like real prophets would put on the official garments of prophecy and say, hey, I'm wearing the garments of the prophet, therefore you must know what I say is the truth. Zechariah is saying that will not happen anymore. And so John is wearing the garment of a prophet. But much more specifically, he is wearing the garment of a particular prophet, and that prophet is Elijah. In 2 Kings 1, a man is described as, and, and these men don't know who it is, they said, hey, we saw someone wearing a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist, and the king immediately said, I know who that is, that man that they are describing is Elijah. So he had this very particular dress that was a hairy cloak, leather belt, and that was Elijah's 
clothing. That was his uniform. And so John the Baptist came dressing himself after the style of a prophet, particularly the prophet Elijah. He was taking upon himself the symbols of that promised messenger, that Elijah, that Malachi had promised that would come to prepare the way of the Lord. Well, what about his strange diet? Why are we told that he eats locusts and honey? Is it just to emphasize that he is a wild man in a wild place eating some kind of strange and wild foods? Perhaps. But throughout the Old Testament, locusts are often signs of God's judgment. Remember that the eighth plague that God sends upon the Egyptians is a plague of locusts. Think of the book of Joel where it begins by telling that, after, that the swarming locusts came and then the hopping locusts and then the destroying locusts come one after another in order to destroy and devastate the agriculture of Israel. In, is, in, in the book of Judges, Israel's enemies are often described as locusts who come through and devastate and devour everything in the land. Throughout the Old Testament, locusts are symbols of judgment. And honey in the Old Testament is used to describe God's grace and blessing. It is used to describe God's word, which is sweeter than honey. And oftentimes, you, you probably understand that it is used to describe the goodness of the land of Israel, that the land of Israel was a land that was filled with milk and honey. And so John's diet consists of both locusts and honey, it is a diet that consists of both symbols of great judgment and of God's great blessing. And so we should see that his diet matches his ministry. His ministry is a ministry that comes declaring judgment and declaring blessing. His diet points to the things that Jesus Christ would bring. Jesus Christ is a king that brings judgment upon his enemies. He brings judgment upon those who in proud defiance refuse to have him as your king. And he brings great blessing upon those who trust and follow and obey him. And so John's diet is a diet that has very great symbolic meaning about his own ministry, but more importantly, what Jesus Christ has come to do. And he is ministering and he is preaching around the Jordan River, people are going out to him to be baptized in the Jordan. And the Jordan River is the river that represents the boundary mark of Israel. In Joshua chapter 3, when the people are going to enter into the land to begin to conquer it, the first thing they have to do is cross over the Jordan River, which they do miraculously on dry ground. It was a river that the exile would have had to cross when they were taken away, it is a river where Elijah was taken away and his ministry passed on to Elijah. And now it is on the banks of this river at the edge of the land of Israel that John begins his ministry. And the reason for this is, I think, that yes, in a sense, the people had come back to exile, but in the true sense, it was not the great return that the prophets had spoken of. Everything was not all right, the religious leaders were compromised. The king that was sitting in Jerusalem was not even Jewish. And so John the Baptist is taking them out into the place where everything began. And baptizing the people in the Jordan on the very edge of the land, he is telling them that now is the time to be renewed. Now is the time to actually come back from exile. Now is the time that God's great promises, everything that he had promised to do after exile, is beginning. And we are going to the place where it all began. Once again, God is on the move, renewing Israel, beginning to fulfill his great promises. And so I think everything that John wears, everything that he eats, everything that he does, has high symbolic importance of pointing to Jesus which, and, and to his ministry and to point the people to the one who is to come. And then when we look at the message of John the Baptist, the basic, most foundational message, the, the ground message that he preached is that the kingdom of heaven is near. That the king of heaven is coming. And when the king of heaven comes, he is bringing his kingdom. 
the effective Messiah, the Christ, the one who will make all wrongs right, the one who will renew the people, the one who would restore the kingdom back to Israel, he is coming. And so therefore, since the kingdom of heaven is at hand, prepare the way of the Lord. Now that verse is a quote from Isaiah 40, and Isaiah 40 goes on to describe all the ways in which the people are to prepare. And the basic point is that they are to get the roads ready for the king. They are to straighten out the, 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 the path. They are to cut down the high mountain to, to make a straight road. They are to fill up the valleys to make the path straight. They are to cut the rough road straight. They are to clean up the streets in order to make a way for this king to come and enter. And many people were responding to John and coming out and confessing their sins and receiving his baptism and his message that the king is coming and were rightfully preparing themselves. But then come the religious leaders. First we see the conservative, rule-abiding, Bible-believing Pharisees, and then we see the liberal upper-class Sadducees, those who would be in bed with the political elites. Now these two people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, saw the other ones as the enemy, but John the Baptist puts them both together and warns them both, calls them both from a pits of vipers, and asks them, who warned you to flee? He said, one is coming after me who will baptize not with water, but with Holy Spirit and with fire. He says the fork that is going to separate the good grain that God is going to keep for himself from the wicked shaft that God is going to burn, his fork is already in his hand. The beginning of separation between God's people and those who were rebellious, those that God would gather and keep for himself, and those who would be separated for burning is already beginning. And so John is saying to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who warned you? And so how do we respond? How are they supposed to respond? And how are we supposed to respond to this message? And the response should always be a response of repentance. After he warns them, or after he asks them, who warned you? He tells them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so I've argued again or before that when we're thinking about repentance, what we should really have in our head is not turning aside, turning back behind us, but rather the idea that something is coming, something is coming for us, something is on the horizon, and we need to get our heart, our focus, our mind on the thing that is coming. Jesus is coming again, and so what repentance means is that we turn from our sins and we turn towards the one who is coming again. We live with our hearts turned in lively expectation of that one who is to come. And then he talked about roots, and he talked about fruits. He says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He tells them, don't pridefully stake your claim on God's salvation. Don't think just because we have Abraham as our father, that means everything is okay. We have the right lineage, so everything is okay. And I think we have a very similar temptation. We have a temptation to tell ourselves that everything is all right because we are the people of Calvin. We are the sons of the Reformation. We are the ones who have not compromised and bowed our knee to progressivism. We do everything right. We homeschool. We're patriarchal. We're confessional. And these things are all good gifts from God. They should be received in faith. But often what happens is that we turn them into points of pride. We turn them into points of selfish uh, arrogance, and we turn them into assumption because God has given us all these gifts. Therefore, everything must be right in our lives, and everything and God is on our side. We have done everything right. We have the right views, and so we pridefully make a claim that God is on our side. And John the Baptist tells the Sadducees and the Pharisees that God does not need them. He is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. He is able to bring the Gentiles in to become the true children of Abraham. What God wants is not the right lineage. He does not want the right kind of people that have all the right boxes checked. But what he is looking for are those who bear the right fruit. 
And if we are prideful, if we just presume upon God's grace, if we look at all the gifts that he had given us and think that we have deserved them or that they say something about how good we are, then our hearts are in no way prepared for the coming of the great king. And what happens is that God will chop us down at the roots. The axe is lying at the root of the trees. Now we have seen this in the book of Ezekiel. We have seen that great parable about that uh, grapevine that spread throughout all the land. And when God went looking for fruit, there was no fruit. And God ripped it all up and he said, vine wood is good for nothing besides the fire. John the Baptist is telling them that this can happen to them. God is coming. When Jesus comes, he is looking for fruit from his people. He is looking at what their lives are manifesting, what kind of fruit they have growing in their lives. And if he does not find what he is looking for, he will cut the tree down at the root. And Isaiah and Ezekiel have told us that God has done this before. God has cut down the tree of his people. We read today in Isaiah 11 that God had reduced Israel to a stump. That God had chopped Israel down. That she had no king. no pre The priesthood was corrupt. And often in league with the Romans who ruled them and taxed them. There was no king. The, the, the state of Israel was reduced to a stump. But Isaiah 11 said that from that death, new life is growing. A new shoot is growing up from the old stump of Israel. And of course, when we turn to the New Testament, we see that that shoot is Jesus. And everything depends on your reaction, how you respond to this new shoot that grows out of the dead wood. Everything depends on how you respond to the new king that is bringing a new kingdom. Everything responds, uh, uh, depends on the question of will you respond by faith and so be connected, united, grafted into that tree and so bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so the question that John the Baptist leads, leaves us with it's a question of will we humble ourselves? Will we bow down and swear allegiance to the new king? The Pharisees and the Sadducees that John calls here a den of poisonous snake throughout the gospel, throughout Jesus' ministry, again and again and again refuse to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. They like their power, they like their wealth, they like their self-importance, they like their reputation, they like holding on to everything that can give them pride, and they refuse to give any of this up, and it takes them down a path away from Jesus Christ to the end of Jesus' life. They declare that they have no king but Caesar, which is the ultimate blasphemy. They reject not only the kingship of Jesus Christ, but of God himself. They have hardened their hearts again and again at the coming of this king, where they become ultimate blasphemers. And so this same king is coming again. Like I said last week, our whole world, our history, each and every one of us are heading toward judgment before Jesus Christ. Your life is heading toward a time where you will stand before him and meet him. And so the question is, are you prepared for that day? Are you making straight the path of your heart? Are you clearing out the sin? Are you humbling all of those proud mountains? Are you raising up those sinful valleys? Are you growing in simple love and faith and desire that this king would come more and more? Are you eagerly expecting to meet him? Are you eagerly and joyfully turning away from sin and turning to face the king? Do you offer this king all of your allegiance and faith and obedience? Are you hoping, repenting, waiting, humbling yourself in preparation for the coming again of this great king? Let us be those who bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you now that we would hear the voice of John the Baptist, that we would heed it this Advent season, that Jesus not only came in his first Advent, but that he is coming again. And so let us be those men and women and children who bear fruit in keeping with repentance, that we would turn our minds, our hearts, and our lives to seek and face the King who is coming again. 
Jesus' name, amen.